This meeting, the April 18th meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come to order. We have two bills on the agenda and we have a quorum present. Senator Gustafson, we'll start with Senate File 4312, Standards for Safe Storage. Welcome to the Senate Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 59 children were killed in gun homicides statewide from 2020 to 2023. In the last year, Fairmont, a four-year-old allegedly found a firearm in the backseat of a vehicle before shooting their younger sibling. Pine City, a three-year-old died of a self-inflicted gunshot while his dad was downstairs playing a video game on the main floor of the home and his son was upstairs in his father's room. It was discovered the nine millimeter gun was loaded and sitting on top of an unlocked gun safe while the child watched a show on the cell phone. In Brooklyn Park, a nine-year-old was shot. According to police, the victim's seven-year-old brother located a loaded handgun inside the residence and was handling it when it discharged. And in St. Paul, just a few weeks ago, seven children, no older than 13, were left alone in an apartment where a girl got a hold of a gun, then shot and critically wounded an 11-year-old boy. From the report, the son and the niece went into the dad's bedroom. They each retrieved a handgun and started waving it around. The two told the police they have played with the gun a dozen times in the past year when dad was not around and the firearms are generally unloaded. The father acknowledged having seen children with the guns before and told them to put them back. The 13-year-old said she last played with one of the guns the previous weekend and assumed the guns were unloaded as usual. As she was waving and playing with the gun, a shot was fired that hit the 11-year-old. This bill was drafted with one clear goal, the safety and well-being of our children. Unsecured guns pose clear safety risk to our communities, particularly to our youngest. When the guns are not stored safely or securely, they are accessible to unsuper unsupervised minors and the risk of death or injury significantly increases. In the home, the possibility of kids discovering and playing with firearms is far too common of an occurrence. It seems each week we hear stories of children accidentally discharging their parents' firearms while playing at home, often leading to significant harm to themselves or others. Many parents assume children are unaware of firearms in the home, but research from the Journal of Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine has shown that children are often know where the guns are kept, have handled them without their parents' knowledge. I have had the privilege of being a teacher for most of my life. Securely and safely storing firearms has ramifications beyond the home. It impacts our classrooms as well. According to the Minnesota Department of Education, 70 handgun or long guns were confiscated in Minnesota schools during the 2021-22 school year. That is more than double the highest previous total and three times 22 guns recovered during 2018 to 2019. This bill makes sense. It is clear that safe storage practices help prevent unauthorized access to firearms. And with gun violence now the leading cause of death for children 19 and under in the United States, we must do something. This single bill won't save every life, but even one tragedy can be prevented with this bill in law. Then our efforts have been successful. This bill, as you see before you, would reduce accidental uh, discharge of firearms by 78%. Member, this bill is supported by Children's Minnesota, the Minnesota Hospital Association, Minneapolis Public Schools, and Minnesota Medical Association. It has the support of Hennepin County Sheriff DeWitt. We have taken over 100 meetings in the last five months. We've spoken with every stakeholder group. Over 80% of the amendments come from the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Amendments were taken from law enforcement and gun violence prevention groups. This is widely popular and it is a common sense public safety bill. The time to pass this long overdue legislation is now. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Um, and I believe you have an amendment that has appropriation and some wording changes in it. Um, would you like to deal with that now before we go through budget? Thank you, Mr. Chair, yes. Senator Friends moves the A9 amendment um, is there a discussion of that, and uh, do you want to explain it, um, Senator Gustafson, briefly? 
Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the amendment clarifies that a firearm only needs to be made inoperable, not permanently inoperable, to be exempt from safe storage. It clarifies that a firearm storage unit only needs to be tamper resistant, not tamper proof. Clarifies the definition of a gun room. It lowers the penalty for violating the safe storage requirements when a child is not present. The firearm is not accessed by, or accessed by a child or a person prohibited from possessing a firearm, and the unsecured firearm isn't in the felony, crime, or violence to cause substantial or great bodily harm to death or a petty misdemeanor. So basically, it lowers the lowest penalty for a safe storage violation from a misdemeanor, or I'm sorry, from a misdemeanor to a petty misdemeanor. And the idea behind that is that we're trying to change behavior, not penalize um, gun owners. Uh, it also removes the prohibition on owning firearms for three years following a safe storage related conviction, and it adds the appropriations needed for the bill. Thank you. Is there a discussion? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Senator, for bringing this forward. Um, obviously, we all want to protect our children. Um, you know, I'll, I'll keep my comments for now on the amendment, the E9. Um, you, my, my first question, um, the tamper resistant, can you just explain what that is and why you changed the tamper proof? I, I think it's needed to be addressed, so thank you for trying to do that. But um, what is tamper resistant? Mr. Chair and Senator Dreheim, um, thank you for asking the question. That was actually one of the amendment ideas that came from the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus, and the idea behind it was that any safe could probably be broken into, you know, just even like the really super nice ones you can buy at Cabela's, right? Any gun safe is potentially able to be broken into, but not likely by, you know, a six-year-old. So we're saying tamper-resistant is a little bit just more accurate because probably tamper-proof would assume that nobody could ever break into anything, and so it was just a legal clarification. Senator Dreham, continue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then just shifting, you know, the, the story you told uh, about the kids and uh, the tragic events that have happened in that three-year period are all awful, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but weren't there laws on the book books already that would have made that a crime for what those guardians or parents failed to do? Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, yes, you're right, there are, but this codifies that you must keep your gun or your firearm safe when you're not in possession of it. And the idea is sort of similar to if you think about distracted driving. Um, we all know that if you got pulled over because you were negligent on the road, that would of course be a ticket or some, you know, a some sort of an appropriate crime would be established to that. But we know that once we passed the law of distracted driving, it made people more aware and they changed their behaviors and then we saw safer roads. Similar to this, it's asking that people just be mindful of it. We're looking for a behavior change. If, we know, if people know that it's a petty misdemeanor to uh, keep your gun unsecured, um, and then of course penalties go up, you know, the more severe it, it becomes. But um, the idea is that you know it doesn't pre it doesn't cause you to have a criminal record. It just is going to be a petty misdemeanor, and hopefully that will change behavior. You'll think twice about leaving your firearm unsecured, um, and that we know will lead to saving lives. So, Graham, continue. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Senator Gustafson, um, for your response. And and this is the Finance Committee. Um, so I'd like to shift just real quick to the fiscal note. Uh, have you had a chance to review the fiscal note? Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, I have, uh, but just briefly, so I would probably lean on our fiscal analyst to go into more depth, if that's okay with you. Senator Dreheim, I was going to have Mr. Turner come up in just a minute and go through it. Um, I figure we might put I'll, the I'll hold off, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Is there more discussion on the amendment? If not... Um, all those in favor of the A9 amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, aye. Opposed? Motion, motion prevails. Uh, Mr. Turner, um, would you be willing to go through the fiscal notes on the bill right now? Mr. Chairman, members, yes. Um, fiscal notes pretty straightforward. The sentencing guidelines uh, analyze the bill. Uh, it creates a severity level one felony. 
they've said that, uh, according to their best estimates, this would result in one prison bed added to the Department of Corrections each year. Um, that cost would be $10,000 in fiscal year 25, 19,000 in 26, and 19,000 27, 19,000 in tails each year. Uh, the cost for this bill is being carried presently in the Judiciary and Public Safety spreadsheet. And, um, and that's, it's pretty straightforward, one prison bed a year. Thank you. Uh, Senator Jaham, did you want to get back to the fiscal questions now? Or? Yeah, thank you. I, I was just trying to tie the, the uh, amendment to the fiscal note. Um, so, you know, when we look at the fiscal note, um, you know, what, what kind of caught my eye is that there is felonies now attached with the broad language in your underlying bill. And you looked at the cases that were statewide and there was what, uh, average of, what was it, 39 cases per year? but only one ended up in jail. And it, it, to me, it, the last thing we need are, are more bills that reduce the honest person's uh, ability to have guns and, and the Second Amendment. Um, you know, in, in my district, we have a lot of people that hunt. Senator Gustafson, do you know how many people deer hunt in Minnesota, average? every year? Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, I know that our family is deer hunters. I don't know how many other deer hunters are in the state. Chair, if I could. Continue. Thank you. There are, according to the DNR, about 400,000, and that number is down. Mm -hmm. So every year, we have 400,000 people go out and, and deer hunt. And in most years, there isn't any incidents. And, and I'm sure like your family, people in my district grew up around guns. And they teach uh, their children to respect the firearm. And, and I think the majority of people are good stewards with their guns and do store them properly. But in, in these two bills we're discussing today, there, there's some pretty broad language that would make good people, honest people, criminals, the way the bills are drafted. Um, so if you continue on on the fiscal note, like on page four, you have the 39 cases per year. Um, and then on page seven, um, you know, they're recommending one bed annually for the increased volume of these crimes and one bed annually one bed that's it so that's all we're going to solve with these new laws so we're going to we're going to make a whole bunch of people potentially guilty of a crime and we're only going to have one bed added um meaning one more person going to jail for doing something bad and, and i think as we applaud what you're trying to accomplish, I think if we want to accomplish this, you know, we have to enforce the laws we already have on the books. And, um, you know, people in my district, you know, they like to trap, they like to shoot at targets. Um, they like to collect guns, to be honest. I have a lot of friends that like to collect guns. Um, and, and I believe they're storing them properly in most cases, but I can see cases where um, if you're out target shooting, um, on the way home last night, I stopped in the center at the gas station to get fuel and a uh, gentleman came in uh, buying a, a hunting license for turkey hunting. He had his young boy with him probably 13, maybe 14. Um, and he asked me about the Second Amendment bills. And I kind of described the bills we had up today. And, you know, he, he would be guilty 
if he was out shooting targets with his son mm -mm. Mm -mm. in the field, and you disagree with that statement. Okay. So you could target practice without, okay, then I, then I stand corrected. Um, anyway, where I'm going, I, I appreciate your efforts. Um, according to the fiscal note, you're going to increase charges where people are going to end up in jail by one person, one additional bed per year. Um, so I, I, I just strongly feel that this is the wrong direction. I applaud your efforts. Um, but I, I don't think you're going to accomplish what you think you're going to accomplish. I think the only way we accomplish your goals is to enforce the laws we already have and start putting people in jail that do crimes um, with guns, take the guns off the street um, from the criminals, not, not the honest people in southern Minnesota. So thank you. Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, Senator Draheim, I appreciate your comments and your thoughtfulness. I too am from greater Minnesota. I, our family owns 10 guns. We are hunters. We have a hunting cabin in Wisconsin. There's a reason why I'm carrying this bill. It's because I am mindful of what the culture is in Minnesota. We are a hunting and fishing and outdoor state. That's what we are. And I don't want to do anything to take that away. This is not a bill that infringes on your Second Amendment rights. It's a public safety bill. It's making sure that children are kept safe or anybody else who shouldn't have access to that gun. To address some of your things, um, I just want to remind you that it is only going to be a crime, I mean, outside of a petty misdemeanor, which is like a speeding ticket, but it is only going to be a crime if you reach that felony level. And the felony level is when a child accesses a loaded gun. So we're not talking about you know, a 14-year-old who's hunting with their dad, right, or their mom, um, because that is already in law, and they have to go through certain training, and they are allowed to go hunting. That's not about that. Um, this is about a five-year-old or a six-year-old gaining access to a loaded weapon. That's when there's the potential for a felony or, par or possibly incar or, uh, incarceration. So there's that. There's also exceptions for trap, uh, trap shooting, um, and especially within the high school league, we have a very active and successful trap shooting team at Centennial High School. This does not impact them. There are carve outs for that as well. Um, I wanna just go back to one quick thing too you said about hunters. I hear two things from people when they say this, and I hear this a lot, um, but that we are responsible, we shouldn't be penalized, we have guns, we own them, we own and secure them or we're responsible gun owners, and then at the same time, this would put us in jail. It would only put people in jail if they let somebody who shouldn't have access, and we're really looking at kids right now, got access to a loaded firearm who shouldn't have one. That is only where you're at that point. Um, and I, I just, I, I wanna remind you that no gun owner is also immune from accidents or thefts. Um, if you look at any, you know, done so much research on what other gun groups like recommend for safety and they recommend this storage. They recommend that when you're not in possession of your firearm that you secure it safely. And most hunters do that. So we're just asking the rest of the state to rise to the level that your family and my family are probably already at as far as gun storage goes. Senator Jay, I'm continue. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, a child, I think, under state statute is someone under 18. Isn't that correct? Senator Gustafson? Mr. Chair, Senator Draheim, yes, but there is the statute on uh, uh, hunting provisions. And, Chair, if I could. Go ahead, continue. You know, I. Obviously, we're just going to disagree on, on this bill. Um, We have um, had some interesting times here in Minnesota the last few years. And um, during the what I refer to as the George Floyd riots, I had a lot of people call me um, from the Twin Cities, scared to death. Um, all walks of life all backgrounds, and I have a lot of friends and family that live in the metro. And a lot of them 
were loading guns and having them nearby because they were afraid for their life during those riots. And those riots went on for a long time, destroyed a lot of property, a lot of buildings. And they were fear fearful. So they loaded their guns, their legally owned guns, to protect their families. <coughs> so I, I understand what you're trying to do, and I applaud what you're trying to do. But I, I don't think you've thought of every incident. So if you were on a block, Senator, where you had people marching up and down in front of your house, and you had small children in your house, <coughs> and, and buildings were being burnt, Bricks were being thrown through windows. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to be able to protect your family? And wouldn't you have a loaded gun if you had one and head it out? By your bill here, they would be breaking the law. So... No. no. Chair? I, I, Mr. Chair, I, Senator Dreheim, if you're in possession of your gun, you're not breaking this law. It's We're asking for you to know what is going on with your gun when you're not in possession of it. And, and what is possess, possession? Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, having it in your possession, having it on your person. So if, if you had a loaded gun in one room and you went to the bathroom in another room, you wouldn't be in possession of your firearm. Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, uh, correct. You need to be in possession of your gun. Mr. Chair, Senator, I don't want to interrupt you. I just was going to respond to your questions if you're not done. I, no, that's, yeah. that's fine. I, I'm done. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, um, yes, I understand. I would like to remind you that I live much, much closer to Minneapolis than you do. And again, our family ha owns guns. We were not in that state of fear that you were describing. Um, we were not walking around our homes with our loaded guns ready to use them on people. It's not something that we were gonna do. Um, this is not that. This is not infringe on your Second Amendment rights. Um, this is saying that when you're not in possession of guns, that you know that they are safely secured. If you go to the Firearms Industry Association and National Shooting Sports Foundation, these are the gun owners that you and I are talking about. They state that firearms should be loaded only when you are in the field or on the target range or shooting area ready to shoot. When not in use, firearms and ammunition should be secured in a safe place. It is your responsibility to prevent children and unauthorized adults from gaining access to firearms or ammunition. I understand that there is a fear that something bad could happen, but if we're going to address that, that is a completely different thing than what this is asking for. This is saying that when you're not in possession of your firearm, that you know that it is secured, safe, so that people who shouldn't have your firearm don't have your firearm. That, that's it. It is, not, it, it is not bigger than that. Is there further questions or discussion? Senator Muhammad and then Senator Pratt. Um, thank you, Chair. Senator Gustafson, I just want to thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, uh, I think the discussion has been um, really important, and I want to um, thank Senator Draham for bringing his perspective into it. Um, I think it is, I think what happened with the murder of George Floyd was really sad, and I think what happened in our city is, um, is something that our city is still dealing with and the harm that came from it. Um, as somebody who lives in the city, who represents the third precinct, that was not the case. Um, and I will also say, our, I, I just want to take a moment and thank our county sheriff for sending um, a letter of support and saying that this bill is about keeping people safe because it's really important that when folks purchase a gun that they know what they're doing with that and they know when to keep it safe. And I know you've been cognizant in those conversations and um, have talked to cross-section of people. So thank you for bringing it forward. This bill is about keeping people safe. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Gustafson, you mentioned the uh, National Sports Shooting Foundation. Do they support your bill? 
Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, uh, they have not expressed uh, support, uh, op opposition, a neutrality. We are just going by what they promote on their website and what they teach uh, their members. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we have the letter in our package today that, that basically says the bill creates new felonies and aggressively criminalizes individuals unknowingly. It's a bad precedent, and we urge you to table this proposal. That sounds like a letter of opposition to me. Um, Senator, uh, you mentioned the uh, Hennepin County Sheriff. Mm -hmm. Do you have the uh, support of the Sheriff's Association? Senator. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, we did last year. We had uh, support from MPPOA, the sheriffs, the chiefs, um, everybody. Unfortunately, politics is playing a role in all of that this year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Senator Gustafson, I'm not sure it's entirely politics because this was a new bill that was introduced this year, cloned off of Senator Coleman's bill, or no, not this one. Um, and let me just uh, read from the, the Sheriff's uh, Association. Um, we empathize with the author's concerns about reducing unauthorized access to firearms and prioritizing the safety of children and all residents of Minnesota. We also recognize the balance that is needed to protect the rights of Minnesotans. That balance is not struck by creating a crime to own a firearm if it is not locked up or within immediate control, even when the children or ineligible persons are not present. It goes on to say uh, that the penalties outlined in the bill are disproportionate to the alleged offenses of negligent storage. So. Mr. Chair, it, it, uh, the, the Sheriff's Association is, I don't believe, playing politics here. They have concerns with the bill. They've identified specific concerns with the bill. And uh, I'm disappointed that uh, Senator Gustafson is, is uh, saying such. Do you have the support of the Chiefs Association? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, before you go any further, I think I know what the pattern is that you're going to, uh, what you're bringing up. Do I have the chief's position? Do I have the sheriff's? Do I have MPPOA? I'm going to say that they're addressing gun owners' rights, and I'm addressing keeping kids safe. I know that they join me in that, but I'm worried about a public safety bill. I am not worried about infringing on Second Amendment rights because that's not what this bill does. And so I know you're going to keep asking about law enforcement. I presented them with this bill. We had many um, constructive conversations. I have a lot of respect for them. I appreciate the conversations that they have. If they choose to stay out of a public safety bill like this, that's entirely up to them, and they, they have made that decision. Um, we're going forward anyways because we know that this will reduce violence and accidental shootings by 78%. If law enforcement wants to join us in that, that would be wonderful. If not, we'll move forward anyways. Mr. Chair? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Senator Gustafson, this bill does not have the support of any of the law enforcement associations, and, and it sounds like you're well aware of that. Um, I am interested in protecting children as well. We have a, a statute on the books today. I applaud your efforts to protect our children. Unlike you, I also want to protect the rights of gun owners. I took an oath in this office to protect and, def and, and defend the Constitution of the State of Minnesota and the Constitution of the United States, which includes protections for the rights of gun owners. So, Mr. Chair, I'm disappointed that uh, Senator Gustafson is not interested in the constitutional rights of gun owners and is uh, moving forward with us. Senator Gustafson, those were your words. And, um, uh, I would encourage members to uh, oppose this bill from moving forward. I think it needs a lot more work. Um, you know, I talked to the uh, uh, MPPOA. They're concerned about uh, what this means to law enforcement officials who, quite honestly, in, in many cases, are rarely, if ever, off duty. They're always, they're always, uh, uh, you, you're never, you're never not a police officer. So, um, and, and I just, you know, I continue to look at this, um, this letter from the Sheriff's Association that says um, that these penalties are, are disproportionate. I think we could have worked within the negligence law that we already have. We could have increased the penalties, um, just like I've been advocating for increased penalties on straw purchasers for many, for many years. Um, 
we're just creating uh, uh, felons out of law-abiding citizens who, who make a mistake. And um, we already have uh, a law in the books for that, Mr. Chair. So I'll leave it at that. But members, we, we, we took our oath to defend the Constitution. I think we ought to do it. Senator Westrom, then Senator Murphy, I think, but I'm not sure about Senator Murphy. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Gustafson, uh, you talk about being from rural Minnesota, but you just seem to have not used or remember any of those examples. Uh, I've got a lot of farmers and rural residents that live in my district, uh, hundreds of townships that I represent. And let's just look at farmers. Uh, sometimes they have predators coming after their animals. I grew up on a dairy farm. And sometimes you can't run to the house, get the shells out, grab the gun, and load it, and then expect the predator or the varmint to still be in the yard that's causing trouble with your chickens or your cattle or your pigs. So you have to be ready for it when the varmint or predator comes. Up north they're struggling with the increasing number of predators eating cattle and calves as they're being born. You have to be ready to shoot them immediately in the act of their, of their predatory offense. And so you don't get the chance to run around the house, unlock your, your, your gun storage, load your gun. So sometimes they even have them out in the barn with them, the guns, while they're doing chores. Set it in a cabinet or a corner behind the door with the bullets either nearby or if it's a real big problem, I've known some that have them loaded with the safety on just so they're ready to get those varmints because it could be a skunk with rabies. And uh, I didn't know skunks could transfer rabies to cattle, but I learned the hard way years ago. When our cattle got some rabies, the vet figured it was from skunks. And your bill is making these innocent people criminals now. That's what you need to register and you don't seem to think is a big deal. And, and as Senator Draheim mentioned, for one more conviction, we're going to make thousands and hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans criminals. It's just wrongheaded. I, I just hope you'll think about that harder because that's, that's the real life application that this bill looks like. As much as the words may sound good, we do have a Second Amendment right. It's up to each individual parent to take reasonable precautions in their own home, whether it's guns, whether it's sharp knives, whether it's fireplaces that can burn kids. There's, there's all kinds of things that people have to learn how to balance the protection and the carefulness. And you think of all these criminal acts that we've had. I, I'm trying to figure out, and Senator Gustafson, in the last several months with some of the police shootings, the one in Burnsville, uh, how, how is this gun going to stop those outrageous crimes that we've heard about? What, what is the connection? Because I'm missing it. Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, thank you for your um, perspectives. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, I just want to talk about when you say you grab a gun, you load it, you're ready for it. We're looking, that would be that you have possession of. So you can go back to your, your house, you can grab your gun. Yes, it's safely stored. That could be a trigger lock. That could be a quick release safe. It's whatever you choose uh, for yourself. But I want to remind you that we're not... We're talking, you're, you, people talk about the, like, what if, the, what if this could happen? You know, we heard last time, like, what if a cow charges a child? Or I just want to remind you that if, like, the number of cows were, is the number of cows killed as many kids as guns, then we would definitely be talking about safer storage of cows. 
This is not about that. The what ifs that you're presenting are valid and those are important things to talk about. But for every time you're talking about what if I need to grab a gun for cattle, I'll remind you that what if another four-year-old allegedly finds a firearm in the backseat of a vehicle before shooting their younger sibling? That's an actual example, that's not a what if. And so while I respect that, and I do, I have grown up in rural Minnesota, and I also have a, we also have a hunting cabin in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, where we have all sorts of wildlife, but we still store our guns safely, and we're here, and we're okay. When we talk about innocent people going to jail and being criminalized for their Second Amendment right, that's just not accurate. It's also not accurate that Senator Pratt said, I don't care about gun owners. It's absolutely not true. This is respectful of the Second Amendment. It's also just saying that when you're not in possession of your gun, is it being stored safely and securely? We are not looking to make anybody criminals. We're looking to prevent danger, accidents, tragedies. It's supposed to be preventative. And so I'm not worried about, when you say I'm not worried about all of this and what is the connection, I am worried about kids accidentally getting shot by other kids. I'm worried about kids who get access to a gun who are depressed and use that for suicide. I'm worried about uh, kids who, have, who get access to guns they shouldn't have and bring them to school. I'm worried about that. And I understand what it's like to live on a farm and some of the things that could be unpredictable, but one example that is well documented is more of a concern to the public safety than the other one is. And I just, I wanna make sure that's clear. You ask about the connection about all of the crime. This is looking to prevent a lot of those tragedies from happening. And this safe storage isn't going to be the thing that makes every other piece of violence in Minnesota go away, but it's one more thing we can do. And that's why we're doing it. That's it. It's not sure. a silver bullet for anything. It's just to say we want to make sure that when you're not in possession of your gun that it is stored safely. That is it. Senator West. Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Senator Gustafson. You say this is about protecting the kids. You have done more to kill kids with the abortion you passed last year than this bill will ever solve. So let's talk about saving kids. I just find that repulsive that Senator you talk West. about saving kids in the, what passed through this legislature last year Senator is West. going to do much more harm than your bill is going to protect. Senator Westrom, let's focus on this legislation and not attacking other members. Mr. Chair, it was her testimony that brought it up. It wasn't me. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Gustafson. I think what we're trying to do here is have less people get shot. And I think what you're saying is that this relates to the storage. Uh, I want to start by saying, Mr. Chair, we better ask the Finance Committee whether the comments that we make in this committee are related to the fiscal aspect of the bills that we review or whether they aren't. If we're going to open up our questions as Finance Committee members to all aspects of the bill, including the non-finance aspects, that's fine. You can just tell us that. We'll be here till about July. Senator Gustafson, I want to applaud a couple of things that you've done here, and I want to indicate I'm a yes on your bill. Um, first of all, we are looking at other states. What is the experience of other states when they pass this type of legislation? Their experience is that less people have been shot. Second, thank you for helping make clear the distinction between a gun in possession, which this bill does not affect, and the way we store them. We are trying to create behavior that makes the storage of guns safer. That's the point of the bill, and that's where I think you will have success with the bill, and I think, Senator Gustafson, that this will lead to less people being shot. Finally, members, um, these are emotional topics, but I hope we can keep in mind that we all have to work together, and when we say things like hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans are going to be made criminals by this bill, or Senator Gustafson doesn't care about the rights of other Minnesotans, we're going to run the risk that we're going to go off the rails a little bit in what has been a reasonable debate up to this point. I live in greater Minnesota. I consider myself a responsible gun owner. I do live with constituents to whom this is very important on both sides. Having said that, let's debate this thing. Let's vote it out of committee or let's not vote it out of committee. And let's try to stay on the same page as senators in Minnesota who are trying to get work done for the people. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Friends move Senate File 4312. Senator Pratt and then Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'd like to remind uh, 
uh, Senator Frentz, that it was your caucus that decided that this committee would, in fact, tackle uh, policy issues when we discussed the uh, SRO bill. We spent over an hour on policy issues. So we've, we've already set a precedent for this, uh, for this committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I don't believe this is going to save one single life. I really don't. Um, if I were out pheasant hunting and I stopped to give my dog water and I, the gun wasn't immediately in my possession and a game warden came up, I would be a criminal. It changes the standard of this from a negligence to a strict liability. And I applaud the, the effort to uh, uh, protect our kids. I think there were other ways that it could have been done. And I think this is an overly uh, heavy-handed approach to addressing that. As the sheriff said, the penalties in this bill are disproportionate to the violation. And uh, Mr. Chair, I would encourage members to vote against Senate File 4312. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. I'll keep it short. Um, once again, thanks for bringing the bill forward, uh, Senator. Um, you know, I just wanted to point out, you know, the, the difference between the story you told, the awful story that you told, the tragic story, I should say, and what Senator Westrom was talking about. In your case, it was, they were already breaking the law. In Senator Westrom's case about the farmer, they weren't breaking the law. And, and that's the main difference. And, and I hope as this moves, we can have more debate. I know this really isn't the place to talk policy. We're supposed to keep it to the fiscal note. Um, but, you know, I, I cannot support your bill. Um, I, I think as drafted, it does make a lot of good, honest people that try to do the right thing and try to protect their family um, in all means, by all means, uh, guilty or could be charged guilty as the bill is drafted. So um, I urge a no vote. On Senator Friends's motion, that Senate File 4312 as amended be recommended and passed. Any further discussion? Roll call has been requested. Staff will take the roll. Senator Marty? Aye. Senator Frentz? Yes. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Champion? Senator Dames? Senator Dreheim? No. Senator Eichhorn? No. Senator Mohammed? Yes. Senator Murphy? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Westrom? No. Senator Wickland? Senator Champion? Senator Dames? Senator Wickland? There being five yes, yeas, and four nays, the motion does prevail. Senator Gustafson, you have another bill, Senate File 5153, BCA and Violent Crime Enforcement Team's Gun Trafficking Investigations and Firearm Seizures. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee members, the bill before you today is an updated and better drafted version of previous bills. In light of recent events, we worked with stakeholders to make sure the bill would be effective and do what we wanted it to do, save lives, make our communities safer. It was our intention to address this issue in the year as more of a comprehensive public safety policy review. A straw purchase occurs when an individual, individual legally purchases an item, such as a firearm, on behalf of another person who is legally prohibited from purchasing it themselves or who wishes to remain anonymous. While the purchaser may have a clean record and be legally allowed to buy them, uh, they are essentially acting as a middleman or a straw for someone else. In the context of firearms, a typical scenario involves a person with a clean criminal record purchasing a gun from a licensed dealer on behalf of someone who cannot legally obtain one 
upon due to factors such as a criminal record, mental illness, or being underage. The true intended recipient of the firearm may have a disqualifying background that would prevent them from passing the required background check. They are a common method used by individuals seeking to obtain firearms for illicit purposes, such as committing crimes, acts of violence. The tragic and violent incident in Burnsville is another reminder of why this issue is important. The preliminary investigation that led to the indictment states that the assailant had lost his gun rights in 2007 after being convicted of felony assault. There were multiple guns in the home. The weapons that were used against the first responders should not have been in the possession of the assailant. One gun was equipped with binary trigger that the indictment states fires one shot when the trigger is pulled and another when the trigger is released, effects effectively doubling the rate of fire. As we have learned, the use of such a trigger essentially creates an automatic weapon which does not allow for any type of defense to be mounted. While straw purchases are already illegal under Minnesota law, our law contains loopholes that need to be closed in order to hold offenders accountable. This bill expands current crime to include the transfer of firearms to an ineligible person, not only the transfer of a pistol or SAMHSA. It amends the mental status required to prove this crime to include cases where the person making the transfer should have known that the person receiving the firearm was ineligible to receive the firearm. It creates an exception for the transfer of firearms other than a pistol to a minor if that person is eligible to receive that type of firearm. This will most commonly mean the transfer of hunting rifles or shotguns guns. The bill increases the penalty for a transfer to an ineligible person from a gross misdemeanor to a felony with a maximum sentence of two years and increases the maximum fine for an aggravated violation from 10 to 20,000. The bill also increases the penalty for a transfer to an ineligible person from a gross misdemeanor to a felony with a maximum penalty of five years and a fine up to $20,000. We have experts from BCA and DPS to explain any technical pieces of the bill that may come up. This bill is one more step we can take in addition to the other actions taken by the committee on gun safety to uh, keep our families safe and law enforcement safe from gun violence. Gun violence requires a multifaceted response. This bill closes loopholes in current laws in order to hold offenders accountable. Every day, more than 120 people in the United States are killed with guns. Twice as many are shot and wounded and countless others are impacted by the acts of violence. Keeping guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them is the goal of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Turner, could you quickly go through the fiscal note on this bill? Mr. Chairman, uh, sentencing guidelines uh, states that they would rank. Mr. The, Turner, could you go closer to the mic? Okay. Hear you they would rank the felony to, at a, a severity level one. Um, this would result in um, one prison one prison bed every five years. So that's why it says that there is no cost to the Department of Corrections. I'd like to point out, though, that, that and this applies to the last discussion as well, um, under a felony conviction, um, it carries automatically uh, a probationary sentence. Most felons are given a, pro a probationary sentence, and sometimes that will include a few days or, or even if it's more severe, uh, weeks or months in a local jail. Um, it is, and that's why under the last bill, there were 71, it was estimated 71 felony convictions, but only one to two of them would go to prison. It, and whether or not you go to prison depends on the, the severity of the offense, and which in our sentencing guidelines, we have a grid. This is, these bills are, are down, they're ranked severity levels one and two. To go to prison on a first offense, you have to have a severity level six offense. And, uh, and then it, it's, it's a grid, so it's a combination of criminal history score. So you could go to prison on a, on a severity level one felony, but you'd already have to have a, a criminal history of, I believe, six um, criminal history points. So you'd have to have a pretty extensive criminal record already. And that's why um, it, 
when we say, okay, there's going to be 71 felonies sentenced, but only one person is going to go to prison, that doesn't include other sanctions such as, you know, probation, uh, local jail, and then, of course, all the collateral consequences that go along with, with, um, with a felony conviction. But in this case, uh, in the case of this bill, the sentencing guideline says that uh, at least at current, current sentencing practices, um, no one would be going to the state prison system. So there's no cost to the Department of Corrections. Thank you. Are there questions on the fiscal note? Senator Pratt. Uh, Mr. Chair, given that there's no fiscal cost uh, noted in the fiscal note, I move that uh, uh, Senate file 5153 be uh, moved out of this committee without recommendation. Okay, Senator Pratt, that is <clears throat> that's probably a higher motion, though I know the author has some um, an amendment that she would like to have considered. Um, I will urge the members to not support this motion at this time because um, I think we should at least consider the amendments and so on, unless you want to wait with your amendment till your wait with your motion until after we've considered the amendment. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it doesn't appear to me that the amendment is going to be uh, anything within the purview of this committee. This is not a financial amendment and could be done on the floor. And so I think that's more appropriate place where uh, it can be discussed. Otherwise, we should be moving this back to judiciary. Okay. Senator Pratt moves um, that this bill be, um, be moved without recommendation to the Senate floor. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Motion does not prevail. Mr. Chair, division. Division has been requested. Those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, raise your hand. By a five, <laughs> by a five to four vote, the motion does not prevail. Senator um, Gustafson, you have the A5 amendment. Point of, point of parliamentary Senator inquiry. Senator Westrom. Uh, you, you said five to four vote does not prevail. Four, Was four that five, five no's? And four votes in favor, five votes opposed. I'm Very sorry. good. Thanks Thank for the for clarification. The Thank you. Senator Senator Mohammed moves the A5 amendment. Um, you want to speak to this, Senator Gustafson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the amendment was adopted, uh, was established an affirmative defense against the penalties if proven by a preponderance of evidence that an individual was forced or coerced into purchasing the firearm because they believed refusing to do so would result in substantially bodily harm to them uh, or death. And this is clarification or expansion of your, the affirmative defense in the bill. This is more language, okay. Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. Is there a discussion about the amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. On the bill, is there further discussion of the bill? Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Mr. Chair, given the new amendment, uh, I, I make a motion that uh, Senate File 5153 be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Senator Pratt moves that Senate File 5153 as amended be re referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Any discussion of that motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Motion does not prevail. On the bill, Senator Friends moves Senate File 5153 as amended be recommended to pass and sent to the floor. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, on that motion. Uh, members, you know, we just heard Senator Friends on the last bill caution us to stick to the financial matters. 
um, we've clearly broken that precedent or it's only applicable to the minority members. Um, and I think that's a bad precedent for us as a body. This bill has no fiscal impact. We just passed a uh, provision that should be within the purview of the Judiciary Committee and the majority has decided that um, we're gonna go ahead and push this bill forward. Uh, it should have never been in this committee, Mr. Chair. It should have been passed out without recommendation. There was no action on any fiscal aspects of this bill. And Mr. Chair, I, I, I am sorely disappointed that we are uh, setting this type of precedent. And I hope we're never challenged again on any policy questions. Thank you. Senator Pratt, in response to that, we, we try and discourage policy discussion here because we want to focus on this and I think members of both party have routinely offered amendments that have to do with policy and modifications of language which this one was and we do consider the amendments people offer um, so I think that is not a change from either past past um, finance committee chairs or this chair, we've done that in the past. Again, we discourage it, and I encourage people to take care of other members on other committees. But that is not, that is something that individual members do bring amendments, and we do consider amendments. Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I serve on the Judiciary Committee, and this, um, this affirmative defense did have a robust discussion, and I agree that sometimes after bills are passed out of policy committees, there more information comes forward, staff may have more time to think about it, and then it gets further refined in the next committee. So I don't think, again, this is anything unusual, and the concept of what we're talking about was really discussed in Judiciary Committee. So it's just a refinement of the language. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Dreheim, then Senator Friends. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you again for the bill. Um, you know, on, on the fiscal note, on, on page four, um, and, and I know this is probably only on part of, of your bill, but it says, because the underlying behavior is already prohibited under the current provisions in statute 420, excuse me, 624.7141, it is assumed the bill will not result in increased criminal case filings. So once again, we have a bill that really probably isn't gonna solve anything, the underlying issue that you're trying to get at, gun safety. Um, and you know, we have a, a, a letter here from um, NSSF, uh, the Firearm Industry Trade Association, which um, talks about the, the binary triggers. And, and this is actually a fiscal point, Chair. Um, you know, they ask about what's gonna happen with the people that already own guns and, and maybe even including your family. As you stated, you, your family has 10 guns. Um, so my question to you, Senator Gustafson, what is your plan to take care of the people in Minnesota that already own a gun that would fall under your new definition? Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, um, I think the bill outlines exactly what now becomes legal, illegal, enforceable, unenforceable. It's in the bill for you to take a look at. The plan is, again, to keep guns out of the hands of the people who shouldn't have them. We're talking about illegal transfers. The binary trigger was a piece that was added by the BCA in particular because it was something that they wanted to address in response to what happened, the tragedy in Burnsville. If you think about what is going on with those triggers, it releases when you pull the trigger and when you let go of the trigger. It essentially makes a continuous line of fire. Um, that is often modified. Um, it is deadly. Um, it is something that uh, we won't, we shouldn't want. Um, I'm, again, I don't, I, I hear what you're saying about responsible gun owners. I don't know um, that leaving that trigger piece out of this bill will actually 
help. It's more respectful to us as a public safety and to law enforcement to make sure that private citizens don't have weapons that essentially make them fully automatic. Chair? Senator Jayheim. Thank you, and thank you for your comments. But I, I think, once again, we're legislating to honest people. And the people that you're referring to, the tragic case, was someone that shouldn't own guns in the first place. They already broke the law. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the disconnect. And, you know, Hennepin County was mentioned earlier, and um, you know, they have a huge number of violent crimes that are created, or that are um, in possession of a firearm that aren't charged, or aren't charged to the fullest. So until we start enforcing our current statutes, I have a hard time changing any of our Second Amendment statutes. But to this point, you're going you're gonna to more or less take these guns away from law-abiding citizens, because a criminal shouldn't have them in the first place. Well, that's taking. That, that is pulling guns out of someone's hands. The ETF does not classify binary triggers as illegal. We are going to do that through this bill if it moves forward. But the financial piece should be addressed. You know, the average pistol is what, four, five hundred bucks, three to five hundred bucks probably, somewhere in there. Um, and, and what I Googled last night and what this letter states is pretty close that you can buy a kit almost for the same cost as a pistol. Um, and then you have to hire uh, a gunsmith to replace that trigger. Um, so who's going to pay for that? Or who's going to collect those illegal guns? Mr. Chair, um, we have Drew Evans from BCA here to answer some of those questions, if that's all right with you. Yes, Mr. Evans, welcome to the committee. Uh, good uh, morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee and Senator. I don't know that I, you know, your question certainly is, I think, related to the cost and where that would be. I certainly don't, um, you know, have a, a perspective on that and what that would be. That's a policy consideration for you as a committee. In terms of the triggers, the vast majority of these triggers that we've seen are aftermarket modifications. Um, we're not aware of these firearms currently being sold, um, uh, you know, on the market uh, with the particular trigger. So in terms of the modification, I do know, you know, certainly if you didn't know what you're doing, you'd need to hire a, a gunsmith to do that, as you've outlined. Um, many of them are done by uh, a gun enthusiasts that have the ability to do that. They're sold in a way that they can um, uh, uh, insert that trigger themselves. But if you didn't know what you were doing, you certainly would have to, to do that. Thank you. Um, so is there a plan to dispose of these guns? So if, if a family member had one of these guns and it was illegal. Um, and and what, what is the, for possessing a, a, a binary trigger a pistol, what is the charge? Senator Gustafson. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's a 20-year felony. So, Mr. Chair, we, we, we are having a bill to make a certain type of gun illegal that is currently le legal. So we're making it illegal. And we're not going to have any way or any guidance on how to dispose of it. And we're going to make a whole bunch of people felons. And then we're not going to pay for it. Are we just going to pass this on to our local county sheriffs? You know, so what, I guess, the author of the bill, what, what is the plan? What should we advise our constituents on what to do if they own one of these firearms? Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, these firearms are not, the, the, what this, as you just heard, 
uh, the Drew Evans from the BCA speak about how most of it's modified. Those are not what is intended for that gun when they go to purchase that gun. So what we're trying to do is make sure that the people are safe who are either live in the home with these modified guns, right, or for law enforcement, such as in the tragic case of Burnsville, not have these weapons used against them. Right now, the, under the current law, straw purchase is a gross misdemeanor, right? So it's often then not even prosecuted because it'll often go either to the federal level and then it becomes a felony. So what we're trying to do is just bring it to that level as the original uh, language said, and then we've added the piece by recommendation of law enforcement to make sure that these binary triggers are also included since we know directly that they are deadly and they don't keep people safe. I, I, don't, I guess I don't know how else to answer that. Uh, Chair, if I could. Senator Jayheim. Thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm not referring to the straw purchase portion of the bill. Uh, it's the binary trigger portion. And, you know, obviously we're not enforcing the laws we have now, so we need to adjust the straw purchase language somehow. Um, and, I, and I'm no expert on, in that. I'm not on judiciary. I, I'm glad I'm not. But on the binary trigger part, what, what is the solution? I have not heard yet where people should do or where they should take their guns because the, the state is more or less taking those guns away from law-abiding citizens. What should they do? What is the process? Senator. Mr. Chair, I think I'll defer to Mr. Evans. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator, you know, in these situations, there's a variety of ways that could that could be done. In most of these instances, the trigger activator, which is the clarification that was done here, and part of the concern that was raised in the, the recent tragedy uh, in Burnsville when it comes to these guns is that the determination that, that was recently passed in terms of what the definition of a trigger activator and a machine gun with additional clarified language is whether or not the current definition met this. There was a discussion about that internally as we were examining this case with prosecutors and there could be an argument for and against. So the idea uh, behind this from the law enforcement concerns that were raised were that this would clarify what was intended to be in this situation. To answer your question specifically, um, you know, law enforcement does take guns we have for many years from citizens as they wish to dispose of them in whichever way. I recognize um, your discussion about the taking and I don't have a perspective on that, but law enforcement does take guns from citizens as they wish to discard them uh, for whatever purpose. So in a situation like this, if it was no longer legal, there are a number of different law enforcement avenues that they would take the gun and they will take them into their possession. Senator Jahan. I'll, I'll hold off for now. Thank you, Chair. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, Chair um, just first a point of order. <clears throat> the, the testifier, I don't believe, ever identified himself, so I just was wondering what Mr. agency Evans, you represent. I, I apologize, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom. I'm Drew Evans, Superintendent of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Very good. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Gustafson, I want to make uh, the, the right connection here, but uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm am if I'm, as I'm looking at this bill and then uh, considering what we just passed. So, Senator Gustafson, can you uh, clarify with me, the last bill uh, will now make it illegal if you store your shotgun in the closet at home, unloaded, but without a trigger lock or a locked door or a gun safe. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, so it needs to be a room that's, if it's going to be stored in a room, it needs to be a room that is used exclusively for gun storage, such as gun collectors usually have those. That's, if that's what you're asking. Otherwise, yes, if it is um, not in your possession, it needs to have either a trigger lock, be in a quick release safe, a regular safe, or like I said, a room that is locked and exclusively used for gun storage. That is the last bill, though, I believe okay. we're focused Correct. on this one. So, so, Mr. Chair, and I'll get to my nexus here, Senator Gustafson, but I want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, but it's, it's a pretty significant point. 
most people I know, uh, especially if they've got just a few guns, they're avid hunter, they might use an empty closet and an empty bedroom uh, to, to store guns or a place out of the way in the house. It might, it might be a variety of places, but that doesn't mean they've built a room out or, or done it, uh, put, a, put a gun safe lock, in, uh, gun, gun case with a lock in. The gun collectors, many of them probably do because they, they go to a much higher level of uh, their, their gun collection is, is their life. Um, but, but Senator Gustafson, thank you for clarifying. Most, most constituents, uh, average um, uh, interest in hunting, it's not their whole life like a gun collector, uh, but they're very interested in having guns. I would submit to you store them in a closet or a, a safe place away from, from normal traffic in a house. But some even might keep them in a closet in the entry, at least one, so it's close by if they want to shoot a rodent or something, as I talked about before. But that's all being illegal, going to be made illegal with your bill that you just passed, uh, if it passes. So here's my question then. With that bill passing, uh, somebody that's storing a gun in a closet, unloaded but without a lock, as we've talked about, would now be convicted under the bill you just passed, banned at least three years from owning a firearm. And so now if that farmer, let's just call him Farmer Joe, uh, is convicted under your prior bill, now uh, Farmer Jane has a gun and she doesn't use it anymore and sells it to Farmer Joe, and yet he was just convicted of keeping his gun in his closet unloaded but not locked up. Um, he's now going to be an illegal purchaser and subject to your straw, uh, straw, um, straw purchaser bill here that's passing, correct? Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, Farmer Joe would not get his gun taken away for three years. That was part of the amendment that we just passed. So that part has now been taken out. Second of all, he would not be convicted of the, since that is the case, and if he's just got that, that is not, that is a petty misdemeanor, and so therefore not a crime, and so therefore the, per, the transfer of the gun would not apply, if that makes sense. So, so Senator, Senator Gustafson, Westman. when would Farmer Joe be in violation of storing, of your storage, uh, uh, new storage bill that's passing to, to criminalize storage without Senator Westrom, I, I understand your, your one connection you were making earlier, but let's keep to this bill and not the other well, bill we've well, already discussed and there will be other chances to discuss it, but. Well, well Mr. Please, Chair, I, I am, but okay. with the new criminals that are under that last bill, we need to understand who's now going to be even swept into this bill, which is, going from a gross misdemeanor to a felony. And so that's why it's a concern as well, Mr. Chair. So if the author could just answer, um, answer that question, it would be helpful to moving along. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, I'm actually going to defer to counsel. We we're just discussing the pieces of where Farmer Joe would be in violation and where he wouldn't be. Um, Mr. Chair, members, uh, under the prior bill, if the person was convicted of a felony violation, then the person would, under current law, you lose their rights to possess during the period that the uh, probation is, is still in effect. So in that case, and, and that would be if a loaded, unsecured firearm is accessed by a child or an unauthorized person, or if the unsecured firearm is used in a felony crime of violence to inflict substantial or great bodily harm or death on another person. So in those cases under the prior bill, those would become felony violations. They would result in the person being ineligible to possess. And then under the current bill, if someone <coughs> transferred a firearm to them, uh, either knowing or uh, reasonably should know that they're ineligible, that would be covered under the new bill. Okay, Mr. Chair, and I'll try to make this quick. So thank you, uh, Council. So on, under the, the situation of Farmer Joe, um, if, if he's convicted of uh, illegally storing it in his house, you're saying it's not going to rise to the felony level, but if he's in the, has his gun out in the barn in a closet in the milk house to shoot varmints loaded with the safety on, 
and a child would come across the gun, he's now going to be convicted or subject to a felony. And now Farmer Joe is not going to be able to uh, be somebody that Farmer Jane could sell her gun to uh, because he's now been convicted of illegally storing his gun in the barn. Uh, correct, Senator Gustafson? I think I've got that right now. Senator Gustafson. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Wisterm, I'm going to have Council clarify what you just said. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair and members, it, it, just to clarify, it, it, under the prior bill, it doesn't matter where the gun is stored because the, the provisions apply equally to in the house or outside the house. So under the prior bill, again, if, if the gun is either is, is improperly secured and it's loaded and accessed by a child, regardless of where that is, that would be a felony. And Correct. then that person would be ineligible <laughs> under the current bill. And, and Mr. Chair and Council, thank you. The, the reason I'm giving you the example of the barn is because that's a real life example. And that's, that's the constituents, uh, Second Amendment law-abiding citizens that we're going to criminalize, but now they're going to be hooked under this law too, and that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, no, I have no further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair um, and uh, Senator Gustafson. Uh, I think this is the first time I've seen uh, a bill author debate two bills at one time, um, so good work on that. Uh, I was so impressed uh, by your introductory remarks uh, as this hearing began and your clear intention about uh, public health and your clear intention about responsible gun owners and your clear intention and your knowledge about what it is that you're proposing. Um, it is always the case that uh, legislation uh, around firearms um, invokes uh, a wide variety of arguments, and we're hearing them today. Um, some of them relevant, some of them not. But I really appreciate the focus that you have brought to this legislation, the clarity and the purpose, um, which I've often heard you talking about, which is to make sure more kids aren't killing kids. I support that. Thank you. On the friend's motion, that Sen Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, have a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Evans, uh, Senator uh, uh, Gustafson, indicated that this was a policy request from BCA. Uh, I don't recall seeing it. Was, was a binary trigger specifically a request from BCA? Mr. Uh, Evans. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, this um, issue is not a policy uh, proposal by the BCA, but there were consultations about this and addressing some of the issues that we saw related to the incidents that we uh, tragically saw in Burnsville and what led to some of the, the, the incident there and the concerns that have been raised in the law enforcement community. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So it's fair to say that when Senator Gusterson said this was a BCA request, that was incorrect. Mr. Evans. No, Senator Marty, Senator Pratt, this uh, particular bill um, is not a, a DPS policy bill that's been moved forward, but it's certainly something that we've had consultation on and expressed the concern about what had occurred um, in this incident. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Gustafson, you indicated a few minutes ago this had the support of law enforcement. I've spoken with both the uh, Chiefs Association and the uh, MPPOA. Both have indicated that they, have, they are not uh, supportive of, of this bill. Um, one is neutral, the other uh, has indicated their opposition. Uh, which law enforcement uh, agency, which law enforcement associations have actually given you a letter of support for this? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, I did not, in fact, say that this bill had support from law enforcement. What I said was that the amendment that we put forward came from conversations that were a, a policy change that came from us, I want to make sure I get that right, a policy change that came from us after recommendations from what we heard about what we could do in light of the tragedy in Burnsville. That is what I said law enforcement was in support of. Now, that is individual conversations that were at the table as we crafted this language. I never indicated that any of that this bill was had the a letter of support from any of the law enforcement organizations. So I want to make sure that that's clear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll go back and watch the tape. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I just want to encourage members to vote against this uh, a bill. First of all, it shouldn't be in finance. 
Um, as we've indicated, there's no financial implication. Um, second, it does not carry the support of any of the law enforcement uh, associations. Um, look, I'm, I'm actually living, you know, living in a community that's very close to Burnsville and having our police officers uh, at that scene as part of the, as part of the SWAT squad um, was, was terrifying for all of us. And we all uh, share that grief. Um, you know, one of the, the firefighter, uh, while technically in, in Senator Port's district, um, is a neighboring district where the lines are very close between Savage and, and uh, Prior Lake. And, and it was, um, and why I carried the, um, uh, the bill for uh, increasing the penalties on straw purchasers. It's absolutely ridiculous, as Senator, as Senator Gustafson said. We're charging these under federal law because our state laws are so inadequate at recognizing the gravity when somebody purchases, knowingly purchases a gun for someone who has lost their rights, lost their rights through due process, lost their rights through their previous actions. The shooter in Burnsville applied for to get his rights back. He went through due process. He was denied. And as we can see, rightfully so. If this were a clean copy of the Coleman bill that increased the penalties for straw purchasers, I think we'd have strong bipartisan support. But we've gone beyond that, Mr. Chair, to a point where our law enforcement agencies no longer support this bill. And so I'm going to request a no vote. On the friend's motion that sent file 5153 as amended be recommended pass. All, the, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Motion prevails. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move that Senate file 733 uh, be moved to general orders without recommendation. On that motion, could you explain the bill? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, the bill is uh, what was originally the uh, basis for Senator Gustafson's bill that we just passed out. Um, it is Senator Coleman's bill. It carries no fiscal cost. There's no reason for that bill to be in this committee. And um, we should move it to general orders without recommendation because there's nothing for us to evaluate or act upon. Senator Pratt, I will suggest, one, that that bill is not on the agenda for today, and two, that we've already acted on a bill related to this with um, that we just passed. Mr. Chair? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can only see that the only reason I can think that we would hold that bill hostage in this community is to play pointless political games. Um, we've tried to move this bill to general orders in the past, and I, you've not made a... a an argument on a bill without a fiscal cost, why that is being held up in this committee. Yes, we've acted on a bill that does that, but it's not a clean bill. And the Senator Coleman bill is a clean bill. And whether or not the majority leader decides to bring that up on, on, on the floor is her decision. But there's no reason that bill should be stuck in this committee. On the Pratt motion that Senate file 7. 33 be passed to the floor without recommendation. The chair urges a no vote, but all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion does not prevail. There being no further business for today, I want to talk about tomorrow. We're going to be beginning at 9 a.m. And we're going to be in the Senate building room 1150 next door, not 1200. We're going to be dealing with the housing omnibus bill, the agriculture, energy, commerce, and jobs. And we hope to, depending on schedule, um, we now have a fiscal note on the worker misclassification costs from the Attorney General, I believe it is. And so we will take that up afterwards. So we're going to have a fairly lengthy day tomorrow, beginning at 9 a.m. in room 1150. And uh, want to encourage members to be on time and also recognize we are beginning to get the budget bills and we'll be moving very through very many of them very quickly. Senator Friends. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I know we want to get going. Um, I thought today's hearing was outstanding in that everybody said what they had to say. I do encourage Senator Pratt and Senator Marty for you to have a conversation about what the right scope of our discussions in finance is. We can live with anything, but tell us what it's going to be, how far we're able to go into the policy debate. All I said was, if we're going to have no limits, we'll be here till July, and I have a number of important appointments in late May down in Mankato. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Pratt. To, to that, Chair. Senator Drayheim. You know, I, I agree we should try to keep it to the fiscal part, uh, Senator Friends, but we, we just spent, what, 45 minutes on a bill that had no fiscal impact. Um, so I... I Majority can't have it both ways. Um, and we have another bill that Senator Pratt just tried to move out of this committee that has another bill with no fiscal impact. So I, I don't think the majority party can can have it both ways. Um, I think I try to keep it to the fiscal part as much as possible. Um, but just two cases here today. Thanks. And just to be clear, the reason these bills are coming to Finance Committee is they are potential financial impacts on the state. There are often fiscal notes on them, even if the fiscal notes show a zero. They are here for a reason. They are in the jurisdiction of this committee. But with that, this committee is adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow in room 1150.